The history of the treatment of Aboriginal Australians by colonial and post-Federation governments is widely thought of as unjustifiable. British colonists, on countless occasions, massacred Aboriginals in acts that were often considered genocidal. As in many other colonial examples, diseases also arrived with the colonists which injured and killed many more Aboriginal people. Examples of slavery and indentured servitude existed, particularly in Queensland. This is without mentioning the mass dispossession of land that occurred across Australia, or the stolen generations of Aboriginal children who were removed from their families. Policies of indentured servitude and removal of children were only wound up in the 1970s. The extent to which wrongs have been inflicted and continue to be inflicted on Aboriginal people in Australia is unknowable, much less able to be conveyed in a video about a referendum. In 1967, the Australian government and its people took a small step towards righting wrongs, allowing Aboriginal people to be counted in the census. This change did not, as is often claimed, give Aboriginal people the right to vote, which they had as early as the 1940s in some areas, nor did it change the classification of Aboriginal people from flora and fauna, a frequently repeated untruth. In 1976, the Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Act was passed which began the saga of native title, or the transferring of the ownership of traditional lands back to Aboriginal groups. This change came after years of Aboriginal workers striking at Wave Hill Cattle Station, led by Vincent Lingiari, for whom the division of Lingiari is named. In 1992, the idea of native title was tested in the High Court and was recognised in common law. Today, half of Australia's land mass is recognised under native title as belonging to a particular Aboriginal nation or group of nations. Under Gough Whitlam's Labor government in 1973, the National Aboriginal Convention was formed, an elected body of Aboriginal people who advised the government on Aboriginal issues. The NAC was subsequently drained of resources by the Liberal government of Malcolm Fraser and, in concomitance with other factors, was abolished by the Labor government under Hawke in 1985. Hawke established another organisation, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, in 1990. Following controversies involving ATSIC's leadership, and the argument being put that ATSIC was not effectively serving Aboriginal people, the Howard government abolished it in 2005. Though many Aboriginal peak bodies and organisations exist today, no such representative body as the NAC would be recreated by the Labor governments of 2007 to 2013. In 2022, Anthony Albanese came to power on a platform emphasising his commitment to a referendum on the voice to parliament. What a voice to parliament is will be discussed later, but let us look first at the method with which one might get a voice to parliament. Those who followed the referendum campaign with any interest will recall the factoids repeated ad nauseum about the history of referendums in Australia. Forgive me for repeating those before launching into some more pertinent examples and lesser known pieces of information. In order to change the constitution of Australia, a referendum must be held. A referendum, like an election, is mandatory to vote in for all Australian citizens over the age of 18. In order for a referendum to be successful, it must receive 50% plus 1 of the total number of formal votes, and also receive 50% plus 1 of the total number of formal votes in at least four of the six states. This requirement, known as the double majority, has been a high bar to cross. Only eight referendums have been passed in Australia. Of those, only one was called by the Australian Labor Party. Labor, as a nominally progressive party, has a reputation for radical change, and the electorate is thus more doubtful about their referendum proposals. Even with support from the coalition, Labor's successful referendum was carried with 54% approval. Bipartisan support is crucial for a referendum to succeed, and has been given at every successful referendum, though not every referendum with bipartisan support has been successful. Referendums without bipartisan support have come close on occasion, such as in 1951, where Sir Robert Menzies sought to outlaw the Communist Party of Australia after the High Court found an act his government had passed to do so was invalid. The referendum was fiercely contested by Labor, but still came remarkably close to winning the national vote, ending up at 49.5% yes, though it was still comfortably distant from the majority of states. This close call was caused by a number of factors, including an ALP at its nadir in the 1950s, and off-stoke fears of communism which had been given form in the 1949 coal miners' strike. The next referendum we should look at is the second question on the 1967 referendum ballot. The first question, which aimed to break the relationship between the number of senators and representatives, is often lost in the myth-making of the second question, which aimed to remove the reference to Aboriginals in the section of the constitution governing census-taking. The support for the proposal, which was conveyed in simpler terms as granting equal rights for Aboriginals, was huge. There was no no campaign, not even an unofficial one. 
As a result, the national vote was 91% yes. This result was achieved by the support of Labour opposition, a tenured Liberal government led by a known quantity, Harold Holt. This was also combined with the historical pattern of Australians supporting fair changes to the Constitution. The referendum stands as the most successful result so far. The final referendum I would touch on is 1999, where Australians were asked whether Australia should become a republic or not. The Republican side was led by Malcolm Turnbull, a merchant banker and later Prime Minister. Though, like 1967, the proposal was put up by a Liberal government and supported by a Labour opposition, the Howard Liberal government had set the referendum up to fail. The referendum was held separate from an election, a simultaneous election and referendum being the usual practice, and having been the practice for most successful referendums. The campaign against the referendum pointed to the elitism behind the proposal, which Turnbull became emblematic of. Sure enough, when the results came in, the strongest areas of support were in the inner cities and wealthy areas, while support dropped off in the suburbs and collapsed in the regions. The referendum would be the last to be held until 2023. In 2017, Aboriginal Australians from across the country met at Uluru and produced the Uluru Statement from the Heart, a document which proposed a tripartite process for reaching Makarata, a word from the Yolnu-speaking peoples who live on the northwest coast of the Gulf of Carpentaria, meaning a coming together after a struggle. The three elements outlined in the Uluru Statement are voice, treaty and truth. Voice, or the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to Parliament, is the proposal of an elected body of representatives from Aboriginal communities that would advise the Australian government on matters affecting their communities. Unlike ATSIC, the voice would be purely advisory and would have no capacity to deliver services. The government in turn would not be compelled to listen to the advice of the voice. The voice would also, in turn, develop the treaty part of the Uluru Statement. Truth entails a truth-telling commission where Aboriginal people would be allowed to put on record their experiences. The idea of the voice was conceived with the aim of being inserted into the constitution so that it could be protected from decay or abolition by subsequent governments. The Liberal government at the time rejected the Uluru Statement, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull referring to it as the Third Chamber, a quotation he would later regret. Anthony Albanese, as leader of the opposition, made the voice to Parliament and the Uluru Statement key parts of his policy platform during the lead-up to the 2022 federal election. Upon Labour's victory, the referendum was set for late 2023 taking the risk of a midterm referendum because of the importance of the matter. The coalition parties announced their opposition to the proposal. Their reasoning echoed the 1999 referendum, as they suggested that it was a proposal for the elites and that it could be legally dangerous. It was suggested that the referendum should be split into two questions, one of the voice and the other of constitutional recognition for Aboriginal people. Peter Dutton, the leader of the opposition, declared prior to the referendum that, in the event that the referendum failed and he later formed government, he would hold another referendum to recognise Aboriginal Australians in the Constitution. He would rescind this promise after the referendum. In August, the date was set for the 14th of October. At the start of 2023, support for The Voice was in the 60s. This position led to an overconfidence in the Yes campaign. The overconfidence was founded on an ignorance of historical referendum polling. In 1951, support for the ban on communism started in the 80s and tumbled with incredible speed, with a result below 50 a few months after those high polls. Similarly, polling support dropped steadily throughout 2023, from around 65 to 40. Rather than changing tack, supporters of The Voice derided these polls as simply wrong. Often mentioned was the 2019 polling failure, in which most polls predicted a two-party preferred result around 2% higher for Labour than actually eventuated. Since then, most pollsters have changed their methodologies to attune their findings. Per sophologist Kevin Bonham, since 2019, news poll has correctly predicted the winner of five state and one federal elections, predicting the vote shares of four straight elections and a referendum in 2022-23 to within 1% two-party, or two-answer for the referendum, preferred. A frequently repeated sentiment during the campaign by average Australians was that they did not understand the proposal. This allowed the coalition and other forces of the No campaign to use, to great effect, a tool that had sunk many a referendum before. The phrase, if you don't know, vote no, was doubly effective in that, at first glance, it made sense and it also rhymed. The arguments presented by the Yes case were largely based on appeals to emotion, while the No side appealed to fear. Consider the following graph of reasons that voters found compelling. 
Another issue is one of demography. Between 2001 and 2021, the percentage of Australia's population that was foreign-born increased by 10 percentage points, and the percentage of Australians who identified as non-European increased even more so. The pitching to these Australians was ineffective. As an anecdotal example, I was speaking to a friend a week out from the vote. Her parents were Vietnamese, and she told me she had no idea how to convey the idea of the voice to them. In this environment of confusion and misunderstanding, misinformation bloomed. In 1992, during the Mabo decision, those against native title would push the idea that suburban Australians would have their backyards claimed by Aboriginal groups. This obviously didn't happen. The advent of the internet and social media made misinformation like this far, far easier to propagate. Combining this with a politically disengaged electorate meant that, if they did find any information on the referendum, there was every chance that it could be untrue, without much chance of being corrected. On referendum day, I recall seeing an interview with a person who had just voted no, explaining their understanding of the voice as a body more powerful than it actually was. When the reporter explained the actual configuration of the voice, the voter replied, Oh, I would have voted for that. Of course, the Yes campaign cannot blame the result all on misinformation. I would ask that you watch the following clip of the Yes campaign launch in London, as if you were a third generation coal miner from Gladstone. <laughs> On the evening of the 14th of October, the decision was rapid. Polls closed at 6pm Australian Eastern Daylight Time, but the result was known before polls had closed in Western Australia. At 7.24, the ABC called that the referendum could not be carried from the position it was in. All six states, as well as the Northern Territory, voted no. The total yes vote was 39.94%. It has been 24 years since the referendum on the Republic. This referendum has likely delayed plans for a referendum on the Republic, and hence any change similar in scope to The Voice is in the distant future, if at all. It has been speculated that The Voice may be the last referendum to be held. The increasingly partisan landscape, combined with the uphill battle of communicating to a disengaged electorate in a world filled with noise and misinformation, would make a successful referendum difficult. It has also been argued that the very idea of constitutional amendment is foreign to Australia today. For a person to have voted in a successful referendum in Australia, they would have had to have been born in 1959 at the latest. A simpler referendum proposal, such as amendment of section 44 to not disqualify members of parliament who were born in Australia but hold dual citizenship, could ease Australians back into the idea that the constitution can be improved upon, rather than being an immovable, perfect object. Sophologist Malcolm McCarris has suggested to Anthony Albanese that he follow Sir Robert Menzies' lead and commit to not hold another referendum while he's Prime Minister. I tend to agree, as I think that the next referendum should be held by a Liberal government which, with bipartisan support, should be able to be carried, and hence move towards further renovation of a document which first began to take shape 132 years ago. Albanese has said he will not legislate the voice, but he may not always be in so strong a position to make such determinations. His government sits with a five-seat majority, and in the event that his government should fall into minority at the next election, forces, perhaps unknown as political entities at this point, may bring the voice back onto the agenda. As to the actual matter at hand, improving the material conditions of Aboriginal Australians, I have no such array of suggestions. Aboriginal Australians have a life expectancy around eight years shorter than non-Aboriginals, are 13 times more likely to be incarcerated than non-Aboriginals, and earn, on average, $316 less than non-Aboriginals per week. In Alice Springs, young Aboriginal men and boys roam the streets purposeless. This has contributed to the crime wave which has loomed over the Voice campaign. It is impossible to say whether the Voice would have done anything to fix these issues, but it is equally impossible to say that rejecting the Voice and continuing with business as usual will do anything either.